Hi, and welcome to Homely Dance, the channel history and board games. Today, in celebration of Women's History Month, I'm very happy to have as a guest, Bessime Uyanik, who's both uh, the CEO of Iron Game Design, but also the designer of the new game of that company, Samuramat. I was very interested in this game because it's covering a period of history that is not that often portrayed in our hobby, uh, but also because it looks like it had a genuinely different approach to cooperative game with uh, this idea that you're going to have a main character and a series of advisors that the player are going to act as. And during this discussion, I wanted for us to discuss about the history of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, Besime's design journey, but also her role as a CEO of Iron Game Design and discuss a bit about the future of this company. So I hope you'll enjoy this discussion. If you do, please like the video, feel free to share it and add some questions that you might have for Bessime in the comment section. And if you want to support what we do here, please consider donating on Coffee. Thanks, everyone. Hi, Bessime. Thanks for taking the time to talk with us uh, about uh, Samuramat, your first uh, design that is just uh, behind me here, but also to talk about your work as the CEO of I Am Game uh, Design, which is a very interesting company for me. We featured already some of your games on the channel because it's a company that takes history quite seriously uh, and does games that are quite unusual in that space in the sense that they are not war games, which are most of the historical games, and they are not pure euros they are just historical games and i think it's uh, exploring an area of the hobby that i find personally very exciting so i'm super happy that you're here to talk about your design your own journey as a designer but also the the head of a design company and finally also to talk about the future of iron game designs hi it's really nice to be here and um, like i appreciate you how you explain what uh, we do with the historical game because it's kind of exactly what you say uh, we want to bring another side of the his history into the board games because i think all of us in the company loves uh, history so yeah, but that's that's really good, and and I feel it shows that everyone in the company likes history. Like in the, <laughs> there is a lot of care that is uh, put into your game, so that's pretty exciting. And also very surprised by the types of topics that you're covering, because on top of covering history in game format in unusual ways, you also explore unusual topics. Uh, I think the Rokar is a good example of this, and Samuramat definitely is another one. In even when you explore topics that are well known, it's made in such a way that it's uh, quite interesting. For example, I think Pax Viking. So we had Pax Viking featured on the show uh, a while back. And I think it was the most interesting depiction of Vikings that I've ever seen in the game. Normally what you see, you see the berserk, you see the, like you have the old imagery of Valhalla and all that stuff, like pop culture uh, mm -hmm. Vikings. Exactly. Uh, and, and, and this one is like, oh, actually Vikings are merchants. Vikings mm -hmm. are making trade roads up to, to Turkey and all this. And it was like, it was refreshing to see something that was taking its topic a bit more seriously and showing a facet that was quite different. Uh, that's yeah that's pretty cool but is it something that is important to you so what would you say is the objective of the company yeah for me as a publishing uh, publisher and a ceo of the company i really want to have like games that are a bit different and we want to show areas in the history that is forget uh, forgotten or like as you said like uh, remembered but in a kind of uh, different way like pax viking which shows the merchants the explorers of vikings which existed and they traveled long ways to do like trading with different companies uh, or countries so that's one part and with samarama the assyrians are seen which i uh, designed assyrians are seen as like this just like the Vikings are seen as like this bloodthirsty, just war, uh, warlike people, but they created so many like technologies, uh, roads, and so on. And we also have like the Ricard, which is Argentinian history, uh, and that's also not like so much in the Western worlds talked about. And it's an interesting period as well, like one week when they have five different presidents. And we also have uh, Catini from Darkness to Light. Yeah. Is one that of we also, yeah, that we also covered on the channel. Yeah, okay, yes. And that's also like a part of history it's not talked about. And it, uh, it is about the independency right in Indonesia, but seen in a different way as well. It's mm. like women and it's education. So 
I love to bring this to the board game table and that people can talk about it so we don't forget about the history and uh, stuff that happened. So, yeah. But that's, yeah, that's a, I think that's a really exciting uh, mission. But then the, before we go back to IM Games, because I want to talk a bit more about the company and what you do, I'm mm -hmm. really curious about you specifically, Basimi. How did you end up being the, the, the CEO of uh, a company like Iron Game Design? What was your your journey into uh, into becoming a professional in the gaming industry? Uh, so board games has always been part of my family, just like a lot of people, I say. Like my family has always played some kind of games. So we uh, backgammon or card games and quiz game has been like big in my family. It wasn't, it's such a social thing. I love this creativity. I like this, that it brings people together. So when I met my colleague, Jon Munker, who's also the designer of Pax Viking and who's been mm. in our channel as well, we worked together at a university, a Swedish university, uh, where we did a game narrative, a research project together, and we worked really well uh, together. So when he said his passion has always been board games, so he wants to bring board games to as many people as possible. So when he talked to me and said, would you want to join me in that like journey or adventure? And I, I said, yes, <laughs> like definitely, like I want to spread board games as well. It's a, such a fantastic tool or way or art, uh, whatever yeah. you call it. It's such a fantastic thing. And I want to help bring that uh, to more people. So that's how it went, you know, <laughs> from from childhood, like feeling good about board games until like I met uh, Jon and we talked about board games and starting a real publishing company. At which point in your uh gamers journey did you first interact with historical games uh and and when did you feel oh this is actually a, an interesting medium to approach those kind of topics because i think like me like i grew up also with games that didn't necessarily had a strong theme mm -hmm. so you were mentioning uh backgammon uh mm -hmm. which is also something that that i played uh, quite a bit when i was younger uh because most um, I'm coming from the south of France, so most uh, countries that are around the Mediterranean play quite a bit of exactly. backgammon, so yeah. it goes across uh, like this. We also played a lot of tarot, for example, so this uh, mm -hmm. trick-taking traditional card game. But like it was really later in my life that I discovered that games could actually talk seriously about, about history. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, when did you discover that board games could be more than what you knew uh, uh, from, from, from the things that you were playing when you were growing up? I, I always love like storytelling, like stor stories. And I read a lot of books. I read, you know history. So, uh, but I didn't really like for me. Like I didn't think that board games could have such a strong team. It was mm. for me. It was like fantasy, or it was you know. It, I didn't, or it didn't have a story to it, like background, yeah. like you said. Uh, but then when I uh, started working with you and we played a lot of games together uh, and, uh, you know, that's when I like got into this like historic. I'm like, this is fantastic. It like combines two of my favorite things. I like, I love his history uh, and learning from history. And then I like board games and it was, uh, and I like storytelling and that's mm -hmm. combining all of it together. Uh, so I would say first when I actually started the journey into the publishing uh, of board games myself, did I notice that. No, this is, yeah, great uh, what we're doing. And was there a specific game that really convinced you, like a game that was your moment where you, you really fell into this idea that, oh my God, board <laughs> games can be so great at, at portraying history? Was there one specific pivotal game that's, or maybe a couple of games? I really liked Twilight Struggle, I would yeah. say. Like, <laughs> Twilight Struggle and Memoir 44 is like, like, Two of the first ones, I usually, uh, really felt like this is great. You know, uh, it talks about history and it's like war games or war, uh, in yeah. it, but you can still talk about it. I'm very much of a discussion person, like even in war games, because you can discuss around it. So even if it's about war and what happened, you can discuss why did this happen? You know, you, you play it and you do like this, you take decisions and you're like, why did I take this decision? And you kind of try to understand why the politicians back then took mm. those decisions, uh, you know. So I would say those two are the games that <laughs> I really liked. Uh, yeah, that, that makes sense. And so you've been the CEO for Iron Games for quite a while. Um, yeah. And this is your first design. Mm -hmm. So there was quite a, a while before you were in the mindset of, I want to 
publish games and show to people that they can interact with history, have their own storytelling moments, and engage with history through board games to the moment where you decided, me, basically me, I want to actually design a game and tell a story that matters to me and create a game around it. When did this shift happen? What convinced you that finally you needed to uh, make a game and this was the game that you wanted to make? For me as a CEO, I have very clear um like thoughts on how I should be as a CEO. Uh, so in the beginning, I just wanted to build a company that was stable. And we're still in that process, of course. You know, it's still a process and it's so many things that are happening. So in the beginning, I was like just trying to help others to get their games out. And I was trying to build this because it's like so many different parts in publishing a game that I didn't even think about it. But as I said, I had such a clear image on how I should be in a, as a CEO. And I want to be a CEO that is supportive uh, with the people that works with me and that I understand what they are doing, you know, mm. so I can be the real uh, leader. Like I can be the captain of the company. And I tried, I did all the things I, I created the home, uh, like our website by myself. <laughs> I never done like any programming or anything like that, but I did it myself. And then I got help to put, because then I knew, you know, what it was that. So, and then Yoon and I were going back boot train from Essen uh, this, in Germany, but there's big barriers uh, still. And we were on our way and he said, you know what, uh, you have tried the different parts of the company, but you haven't, you know, uh, you haven't designed any game yourself. Uh, and this was 2019. He said, you haven't designed any game yourself. So if you really want to see the different parts, you have to see the core because what we do, we create board games. This is the core of the company. And I said, I would love to do it because it's creative and I always been like creative. Mm. So I said, I would love to do it. And he said, do you know any team? And it came to me immediately what I wanted to do. I wanted to do a historical game and I wanted to do a, a, about a woman that was like not seen so much in history previously. So that's when like Samaramat came up. And when I started designing it, it came so naturally because we I do have played a lot of games and uh, what we do in at Iron Game Design that we take uh, history is not just the backdrop to our games it's actually like a part of the game mechanics uh, we put a lot of effort or the artists put a lot of effort to see that it's actually you know um, the way they uh, illustrate yeah and, and the games it's really accurate <laughs> Uh, and if we forget, we have our customers that are equally nerdy as we are, <laughs> telling us that something has gone wrong. Uh, so uh, Samaramat and that, that it's supposed to be a historical game came to me at once when I was going to design this game. Uh, and then it was a process. Uh, and it's uh, designing a game is fantastic, but it's like a lot of hard work. Yes. Uh, yeah. So the most difficult part for me with designing it, uh, it kind of took when you have a historical team that you base the game on and kind of naturally you know what it's supposed to be my game is a co-op game and that came you know because the assyrians they had the royal court and they had like hundreds of advisors uh, in that uh, court and they uh, had people from different vassal states in mm. there you know? and i think it's fantastic that it, they thought about it you know you have to know about the different uh, yeah areas a bit like a bit like what you were doing as a CEO, trying to understand the different yes. parts of your business. <laughs> it's true, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really uh, true. So that's what they had. So that in, then it became like, you're going to play one of these advisors and it's a co-op. Uh, and then it's like the setting I wanted. I, I wanted to have a big map, like you're around the map and you're trying to make sure that you're, uh, the area you're controlling, that it's where everything is working well. And then, you know, so it was like, your advisors and you looking at the map <laughs> and then the, all advisors, they come from different areas. So it's a asymmetric uh, yeah. game as well. So all the different characters have different abilities and different strengths uh, as well. So that came also clearly. So, yeah. <laughs> and you started to talk a lot about the, the design itself. And I think it would be good to maybe uh, take a moment to talk about 
the historical context, because I believe that a lot of people who are going to be watching this show are not going to be necessarily aware of uh, Samuramat in the first place, or they might just have ordered it or uh, mm -hmm. just hearing about it. But I think what would be interesting is to talk about the historical context of the game for people to understand what we are uh, talking about and where is the game being set. Can you give us maybe a broad overview of what Samuramat yeah. is, is, is covering? It's uh, 1811 before Christ, so 19th century in the Near East. And it's uh, about, Samaramat is about this queen, uh, and she was in power for like five years. So her husband died because of civil war. This time of period, of course, was very um, violent. It was a lot of uh, like back and forth with power. Mm. Uh, and so she came into power at the, like a period when it was civil war. And then her son was too young to take over uh, at that point. So for five years, uh, she was in power. Uh, and then she was so important that she also uh, she actually had a steel uh, stone in her name, graced. So otherwise, usually women are not mentioned in the, uh, mm -hmm. that stand. But she made such an impact at that time that it, uh, you, you know, she had that. Uh, and and the game in itself, the because the Assyrian empire as i said it's uh, so far away that we don't have so much information and just five years uh, about of her time it's like difficult to find exactly what happened then so my game is based on the whole neo Assyrian period uh, yeah. so i take inspiration from the uh, whole period and not just the five years which she was uh, in uh, power and they were really big the Assyrian empire was one of the first uh, empires uh, back then and then it came like the Persian empire came after and took out over a lot of the stuff that the Assyrians had built out uh, yeah and it's interesting to look into that that part of history because I, I I'm not sure why but it's when you look at the Western world there is a general fascination for Egypt uh, but if you look at uh, this area of the world, like you had the, the Sumerian that were one mm -hmm. of the first people to actually like create modern city states, um, uh, yeah. come up with um, writing, a complex system for agriculture and, uh, and irrigation. And then on top of this, you had the emerging Assyrian power uh, that, 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 that came to be. And it's something that we don't really engage with that much from a from a Western standpoint. If you look at our pop culture, at the interest of people, like Egypt is really big, but Egypt was later. Like there is something where this felt like civilization as we know it today happened there, so. but we don't have that much interest in it for 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 some reason. Mm. Do you know why why that is? Is it maybe because we don't have as much sources? Do you, do you have any idea of why that would be the case? I, I think so. I think that a lot of uh, it was so many. It's so been such a violent area, uh, and uh, like it's it was hidden. If it wasn't for like the Greeks that came afterwards and found these ruins of this like beautiful cities, like Nimrud, which one mm. of the cities, and, and they wrote it in their uh, documents, it would have been forgotten. Uh, and then in the later now, it's more and more things that are being dug, the, like being found uh, in like the Turkish areas where part of like the Syrian Empire was. Uh, so it's now that we're getting more and more information about it. But it, it was like forgotten because new empires came, and that uh, I think the e Egypt uh, they also had the Greek talking yeah. about it and they'd have the romans talking about it and they had these big pyramids that we can't ignore they're there yeah. you know everybody sees them uh but the assyrian empire it's like all their like buildings because they had amazing buildings they had big buildings where they have found ruins from now they were all like flattened to earth so it's easy to forget and and the the people was just integrated in that uh, area. Uh, I'm part, uh, I'm an Assyrian as well. So it's part of my heritage. So we still yeah. exist, people from that period, but we are getting like less and less, of course, because all the wars. So we are a minority uh, now, but we still exist. <laughs> okay. And just about, about this. So we talked about the lack of resources for uh, to base your game on, for specifically the, the the period of Samuramat, and to a certain extent, like a lot of things has been lost about the new Assyrian Empire. And I was wondering, how did you approach research? Uh, because I know that history was really important to you, but how did you manage to actually work with the limited material that you had? And, and how did you 
managed to blend this into the into the game design? What was the overall process? You, you also had it still has to be a game that is an yeah. interesting game. So it was a lot of I, I need to make a story of it again with the little information I could find. I also needed to make a story of <laughs> of it. So it's a little bit of a story building as well. So. Uh, uh, and it, it is disclaimers where I have and you know used like the map is changed a bit to fit the game. Yeah. Uh, the events that are happening are the challenges that the queen is out. It's like it could have happened. We don't know if it happened, but most likely uh, it's something similar happened to her as well. Mm -hmm. By just reading the few books that exist uh, already, or like the. Uh, whatever I could find, and then you build the story around it. Um, so yeah, you, you still have you have your fantasy and make a game that people want to play. <laughs> yeah, so. And would there be like for the people who are watching us and are really interested in that part of history and would like to explore more? Do you think there is like good entry point books for for them to explore this or other kind of material for them to get a better understanding of the Neo Assyrian Empire? Yeah, there is a lot of books. I don't know the names now. I did. I do have a lot of books at home as well. So there is a book. Uh, there is books, and I know a lot of like American universities are. This period has become more popular there as well. So there is uh, new books coming out about the period as well. There is a lot of interesting documentaries as well yeah. to watch. Uh, I would say now, uh, which makes me happy. So if someone is interesting, I think it's uh, easy to find about a general, uh, uh, like uh, overall uh, thing about the Syrian Empire. For me, it was more difficult because I it was like a 1800 before a uh, 19th century, 9th century, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so it was more of a limited time that I tried to focus. To focus on. on. Uh, so the rule book uh, mentions that the game aims to create like a nuanced image of the new Assyrian empire and highlight this strong female leader that is uh, Samu Ahmed. And I was wondering as a designer, how did you integrate these goals into your design? Like what specific mechanics or what specific things in the game did you do to actually achieve that goal? Yeah, uh, with the nuanced uh, image of the Assyrian Empire, it's uh, it's more that it's seen as this period is seen for those that know a bit, uh, they see it as a very uh, a lot of uh, violence and and the military. Um, the Assyrians were brilliant in military tactics. They, they built. Uh, that's why they remembered as well because they built all this technology for like the army. They had engineers going with the, like the soldiers. <laughs> so that's and and then the Bible picked this up, of course. And the Assyrians are mentioned in the Bible uh, as uh, violent as well. So when I, of course, again, it was a violent uh, period. We shouldn't like ignore what actually happened in history because that's like forgetting. We should just not remember part of it. It should be, uh, you should see both the violent, but also the great things that they left for us now. Uh, they created a postal system and within two weeks they could like uh, have um, messages sent from one part of the empire and the empire was big uh, to the other part like Egypt. They controlled Egypt for a while. And that took two weeks. Nowadays, it seems like if it doesn't go in a second, that's uh, slow. <laughs> but back then, two weeks was amazing. And I show that they had a woman had also power uh, back then, uh, and they had. The, so I tried to show those things with the event card or the Asher cards that I have. Not the military is there, and there is like enemies attacking, so there is war as well. But there is other things uh, that is happening. There is trades uh, and so on. So I tried to show that. Uh, and and with a woman in power, I tried to. That was kind of fun because I could like reflect on my own part as a CEO uh, and the challenges I have <laughs> as a CEO, and put it because she probably had the same problems I have <laughs> back then. But she had a big empire. I have a small company, <laughs> so a bit different. But it's still you know the challenges she had. Um, uh, and it's of course for all, not just the female CEO. The, the, the challenges for a person that is leading is uh, it's interesting as well to show, you know, because I have something called effect uh, tokens uh, in the game. And it's like if you take a decision uh, and you know you have to take the decision, something bad ends up in a bag you have. So an uh, effect token, which can show up later on. So you don't know, should I take this decision? 
and maybe something worse would happen later, uh, but I need to take this decision now, or should I not uh, you know, take this decision now uh, and have the challenges in hand? Uh, so it was interesting to show both those things, both a strong female leader and uh, like a new way of seeing the Assyrian Empire. And as you mentioned, so this game is a, a collaborative game. Was yeah. it for you an obvious choice to make a collaborative game instead of another kind of games? And how, what, this, what led to this decision? No, it wasn't obvious. <laughs> Started out with being a PvP. If I would like, I I like uh, competing with others I, against others. I mean, so for me, I, that's the games I, <laughs> I usually like. And before doing, uh, when I decided it was going to be a co-op, and it was just because of the historical facts, what I was reading, you know, and the ro royal advisors, as I said. So now you play one of those real royal advisors, but that came like later. Uh, so, and all of a sudden it was a co-op. <laughs> and uh, as I said, I didn't play co-op so much myself. So I started playing a lot of uh, co-op, uh, other co-op games to see like, what do I like in these co-ops and uh, what do I want to do different? And one thing that uh, stuck me really is like in a co-op, I really want everyone to be involved all the time. Uh, so in kind of all decisions, that's what you do. It sounds so uh, Swedish. Uh, <laughs> it, it does. Swedish. It, yeah, yeah. It has it, to be, it, like the decisions has to be taken together. <laughs> yeah, collectively. Yeah, it's the same in Denmark. Like it. Uh, yeah, you can. Yeah. I, I I recognize that. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's um, so that's something I wanted to have in in here as well. And you do in in the game Samarama, you do take decisions uh, together, and you have to. The first player is not decided automatically. You decide in each round. Uh, who plays it first because that matters as well so everything is kind of you know i have this card should i start what happens if i start you know taking my decisions and so on so everybody's involved kind of the whole time uh, during the game uh, which i think it's interesting uh, for a co-op game and which co-op game inspired you the most because I, I was looking through the rule book and i could see some elements of a bit of pandemic here and some other stuff there and i was wondering what what did you play and what struck you in the in the in the cooperative uh, okay. game design space yeah of course you have to play pandemic when you play <laughs> when you start doing a co-op uh, uh, I played also like Treasure Island, is it called Treasure Island? Um, you don't, as a designer, I would say you don't really think what you're taking. It's like more of an inspiration and then you take it to your own way of doing like an author. You get inspired by something, but the way you write it is your own way of writing it. So yes, uh, I took inspiration, but uh, I feel me together with Robin, who is the game developer, got it to a step that it's... Uh, you know, you feel us in the game as well. After this experience designing a game, do you feel like you'll go back to your position as a CEO or you might continue to explore game design and once in a while you might do other games or you're, or you're done? You've done one and that's <laughs> no, good enough. No, it was a fantastic uh, experience. Uh, and uh, I really admire all designers that are doing this because uh, creating a game is, you know, it's so challenging, but it's so much fun as well. And the best part is like get, when people start playing your game and you see them enjoying that game. That's uh, like uh, so nice. That's what you want as a designer. But I would definitely do more games. I have more stories in my head uh, that I want to tell. And it's going to be historical games. And of course, I'm going to continue lifting uh, women uh, or marginal uh, people to, to bring them up, both in my own games that is coming. <laughs> but also with uh, other designers. You were talking about the excitement of seeing people receiving your game. Yeah. And if you're thinking as a designer, what would you hope to see uh, in that reception? Whether or now that the game is being shipped uh, to players, what do you expect that players will get out of Samuramat? I want them to go into the his, his, uh, story, like the historical part. I want them to learn something about that period. I want them to feel the story, like uh, every step you take is a story. Like when you move a character, this is what's happening. Uh, I want to see them do that, you know? So I think that's the two parts of, you know, so. <laughs> so for them to explore more uh, yes, in that, in that area. 
And now I would like to go back to your role as a, as a CEO. Uh, mm -hmm. So Iron Game Design has been uh, developing quite a lot uh, recently. I feel yeah. like the, 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 the frequency of the number of games being released every year seems to, to, to grow. And I was wondering, how do you see the company evolving in, in the next few years in terms, of, uh, in terms of production? Do you think about keeping that rate of game uh, every year, expanding it? Even expanding maybe the different formats. What 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 is the what is the future of the of the company in that regard? Yeah. We're going to continue doing new games, but <laughs> we're going to slow down the pace definitely. Yeah. We wanted to build a big product catalog, which we have now. We have thirty plus titles in our product catalog. So, but we want to continue like bringing new games, and I want to continue bringing, as I said like uh, historical parts that are not talked about otherwise, marginalized groups. I, I want, still want to talk about those things. So unique games to the board game uh, market, like the, to the players, that's what I want to do. But since we, we want to like slow down, we also want to do more around the titles that we have. We put so much research and time in the design for each game. So there is so much material for each game. So now we have started taking it to also the digital form. Uh, we have just uh, released like Neanderthal in Greenland, which is two of the uh, products in our catalog. Uh, and then seeing, because we want to spread, do board games and yeah. going digital now you're thinking like how do you spread with the digital but <laughs> we're hoping that some people can start uh with the digital but also go into the board games later i don't think one takes out the other i think they uh, actually can help each other um so so yeah. you're developing digital version of actual board games yes. uh but it will always be in, in that uh direction so you will still have board games at your core Yes. developing digital implementation and hoping that it would bring people to the core uh, which yeah. is which is uh, board games you're not thinking about developing apps or things that are digital first for example no we're not board game is our passion and board game is what we want to do the physical we want people to meet around the table so that's yeah. what we want to continue doing uh, so that's definitely our core. That will always be our core. Uh, so the board games first uh, and foremost, and then everything else is just uh, add-ons to bring people to the core. Uh, so we will continue with the digital, but it will be based on existing uh, board games uh, first up. So, and we want to help others. So something else that we are doing in the company, uh, because we get so many game submissions uh, yeah. to us. And unfortunately, uh, we already have a production. We we plan several years ahead, uh, which we have to do. And we have a lot of production uh, like pipelines still like producing uh, games. Since we know this and we want to help uh, people get it out with their board games, we're starting a publishing service now as well, which we, with our experience, we help people taking the steps that are boring that I do as a CEO. I have the fun part being a designer, but <laughs> mm -hmm. no. uh, which is the part where you uh, take it to the manufacturer, you do the whole fright, uh, you have the uh, sending it out to customers uh, and sales and stuff like that. So there's so much wrong going on around it. And a lot of um, designers, uh, they just want to design uh, and they do it as maybe as a hobby. For us, it's like a part of our what we do as our job, but a lot of it have, have that as a hobby and they really want to get their games out. And I think it's fantastic. We should have people saying, oh, it's so many board games out, but it's there's so much people and people like yeah. different stuff. So just, you know, there is not too many board games and uh, more board games uh, because there's different teams and people like different things. So so we also have a publishing service now where we're trying okay. to help. Uh, so and this is something that is open to um, like to to people who just want to self-publish their design. They would yes. go through you. And what what's the service that you are offering? Are you helping with graphic design or just helping with the purely the production aspect of it? We're truly it's truly the production aspect. Of course, we have discussions if people want to help, and we help them a bit uh, because yeah. we, we have made our own mistakes uh, and we learn mm. from our own mistakes. So we do look at the uh, like the graphics and. Of course, we don't. We read the real books because if we we're still helping them, so we want to help games that are. We want to know what we are, you know, doing. Because uh, there is still a selection think, process, right? You are not taking. There, any, yeah, there will yeah. always kind of be a selection process because uh, not anything, <laughs> I would say. Uh, but then we help 
would so usually the game comes already done to us so it's the design and the graphics the, uh, the person has done by himself uh, or his, herself uh, and then we help out with the rest uh, and it's complete it's uh, books have done this for a long time so there is possibilities to self-publish your book but we haven't seen uh, self-publishing for board games so this is an opportunity to do that uh, as well yeah, because it's true that most of the self-publishing options that we have out there are mostly the print-on-demand service, like yeah. uh, Blue Panther and things like this, mm -hmm. which is very cost-ineffective, very exactly. constraining in the types of material that you can make. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting to have like companies like yours being an interface with actual manufacturers that would manufacture yeah. for professional uh, board game companies. Yeah. I wasn't aware of that. That's actually super interesting. Maybe a discussion, but more an offline discussion. To have. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious about this service. But uh, but it leads me to another question that I think is, is quite interesting. Um, and I've been thinking a bit more about, uh, especially with the, a game like Earthborn Ranger. I don't know if you know this game. It's a, it's a card game, but they're already working in having, making sure that it's a sustainable game and there was another game that uh, another company that we featured on the show recently called East Games. That is a lo small uh, local French company that is trying to be really careful about the environmental impact mm -hmm. of of their games. And it looks like the industry, the players, but also the industry are increasingly conscious about the environmental impact of of their games. They are published. They are produced in China. They are being brought back uh, yeah. in uh, distribution hubs. Then they go all across the world. There is a lot of single use plastic in them and everything. And I was wondering, are you thinking about those things, about the future of the industry in that sense, and how are you approaching those upcoming challenges when it comes to sustainability of the products that you're selling? And we're definitely thinking of, uh, about it. It's really important for us with the sustainability, especially for my colleague, Yoon. As I said, you heard me say, we took the train from Essen because he doesn't want to take <laughs> like uh, flights. So from Essen to Stockholm, uh, Sweden. So, uh, so it's really important for us. And we do think about these parts as well and how we should. One of the aspects we do is we want to have replayability in our games. So don't just buy a game, play it once, and then not buy, buy a next game. You know, you should have a game that you enjoy and you can play over and over again and it's still interesting. So we have a lot of cards in our games, for example, because it should be like, you should be able to play. We're also thinking about plastic now. So we're taking away as much as we can uh, of any plastic. Uh, so wooden components are just uh, cardboard, but still it's, uh, and we try to make games that are a bit smaller. Not my game, it's still big, <laughs> but we have small boxes. Uh, it's not that anything, big. It's, it's not that big, no, I for know. For the content it's that it has inside. Or it's or like Gloom. Yeah. <laughs> Those games. <laughs> but yeah, I wanted to, because that's also one thing that made me think about it. And you were talking about uh, trying to reduce the amount of plastic. I, there is one thing that is being done in this game, and I would probably add a B-roll, but I wanted to show it. So. A lot of so you created those figurines where you actually punch and then you just fit them on exactly. top of the other and then you put them in and i know that most board game companies today would actually have done plastic minis mm -hmm. for that I know. yeah and i think <laughs> we need to move away as an industry yeah, from plastic do. minis and i'm like <laughs> can we stop especially if they are bad like you don't yeah. really have a good sculptor and no one is going to paint them and it's going to look a bit ugly on the board it's going to be <laughs> great you're like this is beautiful. Why don't we have those? This yeah. is what we want. This is fine. Uh, exactly. It so, is. Yeah. <laughs> so I was, is, was this a conscious choice? Did you have a debate around should we have miniatures no. or should we have, yeah. No, it's a, it's a conscious choice uh, that we should have as little plastic as possible in, in the games. And we're going more and more towards like having less. Unfortunately, it's still really expensive. And uh, for us, we're still small. We, I wish uh, we will go more and more, the more we can towards like uh, environmental friendly choices. And we try to talk to the manufacturer. Is this better or this, uh, you know? So when we to take material choices as well, and we will move more towards that. Uh, and uh, Jung, as I said, he's <laughs> very into this. So he wants to make a game that is completely like on recycled uh, material that you reuse for the games. Uh, but it's still for a company. And if you want to continue like doing board games uh, and spreading board games to a reasonable price, uh, it's still unfortunately uh, very expensive. Yeah, so. and it's uh, it's not something that happens overnight. It has to no, be a process. But um, we want to so... be part of it. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, but that's well, interesting. If you want to, at some point, you have some developments in the future around this, I think it's an interesting topic. I would be happy to um, to, to to discuss it more. And mm -hmm. then there is one last question that I was wondering about uh, regarding Iron Games and the future of it. So you have really this uh, concern about portraying history with accuracy, making your games also kind of educational. Do you mm -hmm. have any ambition of maybe targeting a younger audience or even may maybe making ludopedagogic material um, working in education? or is that something that you don't think you're going to go in that direction and you really focus on the pure entertainment side of things? No, we're actually going in that direction. <laughs> so, so that's like the digital form, uh, the publishing service that we have, and then we have actually the educational, just like as you're mentioning, because a lot of people and teachers uh, reach out to us and say, I use your, we use your games uh, in, uh, in the school as a uh, you know inspiration so we're gonna we are like moving towards that we do you buy the board game but we're gonna do material around help out uh, like both homeschooling with thinking yeah. uh, for uh, parents they want to have but also schools uh, they want to have a material because our games are usually so complex but the parts the components in them can be used uh, as well uh, because we do put a lot of time in thinking out the uh, like uh, the stuff in the cards as well. So um, this is something we're going towards uh, as well this coming year. Yeah, this is, is really something interesting. else we can talk about, you and I. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I would really like to, to, to discuss about this further because the ludopedagogic part of it is something that I've been thinking for the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And the first moment where it really struck me is when my first design, Red Flag Over Paris, was released. I actually had quite a few uh, history teachers in France reaching out to me and asking for additional material around the game because mm -hmm. for them it was a topic that was recently reintroduced into the curriculum for uh, high schoolers and they saw the potential of and it's really interesting because we have a generation of teachers that are like my generation or younger and they are more open to using games also as a, uh, a teaching device and they were just exploring it's like oh i have this new topic that i have to integrate in my curriculum how can i get yeah. my students excited and more naturally they come to that and i really feel like there is a growing appetite in the um, educational uh, side of things and i'm i personally think there is an opportunity there and i'm excited to see publishers like uh, mm -hmm. iron games also going in that direction i wasn't aware so it wasn't a, a targeted question that i knew i needed to ask i wasn't aware that <laughs> no. you were going in, in, doing this so i'm yeah. just super excited to see that that you're doing this because like it can be, they don't need to specifically play the game, but interact with the components, exactly. understand how they how they impact the game, and think about the historical implication and what it represents. Is mm -hmm. something that I think can be a like really cool material for 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 teachers. So yeah. I think it's it's super super exciting to to mm -hmm. see that. But that yeah. could be a, a follow up discussion. Like if we have a panel on ludopedagogy, pedagogy, it could be great to have you Absolutely. on also. Mm -hmm. So that would be really good. But I wanted to thank you for the time that you gave to me uh, today to answer all of my questions. Uh, and I hope to have you on the show again. We talked about uh, teach and play of Samuramat. I think that would be pretty great. Uh, okay. So I'll reach out to you to see uh, if we can find some time so we can actually show the game to, uh, uh, to the audience here. And to people watching, if you have uh, any question to Besime, uh, put them in the comments and I will uh, forward it uh, to you. And we can potentially maybe address those questions uh, when you come back for uh, the teach and play of Samuramat. But thanks again and see you soon.